Professor of Weed Science at Colorado State University. Dr. Dion. I am a doctor, but uh, uh, that's not my claim to fame. <laughs> well, tell me a little bit about your uh, background and your experience. Oh, sure. So I actually grew up in France, uh, uh, not in an agricultural background. Uh, but growing up, I always uh, thought I would be a lumberjack. And so I was interested in biology and plant science. And in France, in fact, uh, you get uh, directed pretty early on in different career paths. So I attended a high school that specialized in agriculture. And uh, through that school, we had to work on farms at, uh, during the spring vacation and during the summer. And through those experiences, I really discovered that I was passionate about plants and not so much about animal science. So then I did college. and I followed a path of plant science botany degrees, plant physiology degree, and a doctorate in plant physiology. So where, where did you go to school initially, university? Oh, so I was in Texas for many years. So I went to a school in East Texas called Stephen F. Austin State University. And I went there specifically because they had a forestry degree. Because at that time, I was still thinking about you know forestry and lumberjack. <laughs> Actually, the symbols of the school was a lumberjack. Uh, but it's through taking classes in general plant science that I discovered that I was more passionate about physiology of plants. And that directed me to then pursuing a PhD at Auburn University in Alabama uh, in plant physiology. And then through that, my project involved uh, a herbicide, and that was my first introduction to the kind of work that I do today. So you're a Frenchman that ended up in Texas but then through Alabama and is now in Colorado. Yes, and with a 20-year career with the USDA in Mississippi as a researcher in natural products research. So what, in, in what particularly natural products research? Tell me some of the things you did. So um, as I mentioned, my uh, exposure to the research I did during my PhD introduced, to, introduced me to the way herbicides work. And I was working with a synthetic herbicide called sulfentrazone, um, but that's not you know, so interesting. The main point was that uh, uh, when I was with USDA, I was at the National Center for Natural Products Research on the campus of the University of Mississippi. And the USDA unit was called the Natural Products Utilization Research Unit. And our goal was to look at natural products to identify new pesticides that would be from natural sources rather than synthetic sources. So my job was to work with the chemist to discover new natural herbicides. Now, it's a very interesting thing because you say herbicides and one immediately thinks of these horrible chemicals that you spray on plants that are toxic to everything around. Right. But, but tell me how that might not be true. Right. Uh, so that's actually a very uh, good question uh, because uh, there's a mis general misconception that if something is natural, it's safe. Uh, and so in the case of uh, uh, maybe compounds that would have pesticidal activity, some of the most toxic pesticides will be natural products, right? Py uh, pyrethrins, permethrins. Yeah. Think, yeah. Uh, but, I mean, uh, there's a lot of natural products that are very toxic to humans. So, in fact, uh, it's one of the reasons why EPA was created, as you know, if you're familiar with the uh, Silent Spring from Rachel, Rachel Carson, Rachel Carson you know, yes. right? Has a, had a huge influence on the, um, the regulations of pesticides. And so that the EPA's main function is to make sure that pesticides that are registered to be used are safe to the environment and safe uh, to humans. Uh, and so um, there's always the issue of risk versus benefit. Uh, so the question is, will 
it be more beneficial to use a particular pesticide versus is it too risky to use that particular pesticide. So, for example, there are a lot of fungal diseases that uh, causes accumulation of toxins in plants that are very toxic to human, like aflatoxin, uh, you know, there's many other, other ones, um, so that if we were to not use particular fungicide, then these food products would actually be more toxic than the fungicide itself. So these are the issues, and that's not, I'm not in the regulatory area, so you know, for me, whatever the EPA says is safe because they've done the studies. Uh, that's what I, I tell farmers is safe because, you know, it's gone through the whole re registration process and the studies have been done to show that it's safe. Uh, but that to say that because it's a synthetic pesticide that does not mean it's not safe. So in your career, you've taken a path that has taken you to a particular place here. But it strikes me that, it, that uh, looking around your office, we've got a Pink Floyd poster on the wall, and you have a mandolin in the corner, and I've got some block prints on the wall here. You're, you're sort of a Renaissance man in some ways because you're looking at all of these different areas of interest that are obviously of personal mm -hmm. interest to you. Yes. But the study of forestry is very much like that as well. It's, it's many different things that go into one field of study, and it does strike me that your current field of study might seem to be just about plants, yes. but it's not really. It's reactivity amongst many different topics and how, how, that, how all of those might work together into one field of study. Right. And so this has always been a, a source of uh, uh, tension in some ways, that the way scientists are trained is we have a problem. We reduce it to testable hypotheses typically A to B relationship. We study this relationship, try to determine what it is. But the conflict comes in the, in the uh, when we start thinking in, in terms of systems, that that A to B relationship that we are testing is not in a vacuum, it's part of a system. So whenever we, in my field of weed science, we very often, uh, some of the work we do involve understanding how plants become resistant to herbicide. So we do the studies, breaking down to testable hypotheses. We do these experiments. We try to, through these experiments, to determine what has happened to the plant. And so then we have a very simple answer of A to B. We found this mutation, this muta mutation does this, and that's why the plant has become resistant. But this is within the context of well, what else is this mutation doing in the plant? Is this affecting its fitness, its ability to reproduce? It's not only resistant to the herbicide, but are there other consequences? And then we can look more at the ecological level. What happens with that weed with respect to its interaction with the environment and the soil and other crops and other insects? Um, so really things get very uh, complex and that's the idea of working with systems. So we work on the, breaking down the systems into testable parts, and we all have areas of expertise to test those things, but we always work within the context of a system. And I think that's one area that we, I think, as scientists need to all get better, is to make those connections with other uh, scientists so that we have a better picture of the whole system rather than just the one hypothesis that we're trying to test. Okay, so, so you say that you're a weed specialist, and I'm sure that you you get a little bit of ribbing for that particular thing, so thank you for taking it, <laughs> taking one for team science. But, um, and we are here at CSU, so maybe maybe that's a special department on the third floor that you're, that yeah. you just send people to on weed science. No, the other weed science go to the third floor. Yeah, 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 yeah. actually the name of the building where we are located is the uh, uh, Weed Research Laboratory. Okay. Uh, which uh, we always get students come in asking us, what kind of research do you do in here? And uh, we tell them it's not the kind of weed you're thinking about. <laughs> Well, I wondered about that. We met you at the FFA convention, and I and wonder if the 16 and 17 year olds hear that you're a weed special and go, oh, and you say, not that kind, and they say, oh, yeah. but, or <laughs> maybe not that kind of thing. Go visit the third floor. But it, but it, it really is something that, that, that has a really a great potential for study. And so you have a whole department here. Tell us a little bit about what the different, uh, you're going to take us on a tour in a minute. Yes, yes. But tell us a little bit about, about what, other studies other than yours go on in this department. Right, so uh, the department is not only weed science. Uh, the department name is agricultural biology. And so within the department, we have a weed science expertise area. 
which I'm part of that team. And then we have an area where they look at in, uh, entomology, which will be the insect part of uh, uh, pest management. And we have plant pathologists, which will look at the diseases. Uh, and then we also have uh, more e uh, ecologists that look at the relationship of these insects uh, and diseases and weeds within the environment. So it's the, the department is agricultural biology, and we cover all of these areas. Yeah, it's sort of like chaos theory in the works, isn't it? You never know which little interaction is going to interact with the other one and tip things in a different mm -hmm. direction. So it's really great that you have a little bit of the world of insects in here with the world of weeds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so, uh, and actually we have one a specialist, uh, uh, Dr. Nachapa, who is what's called a vector biologist, who actually has a very interesting uh, position within all this where she's looking at uh, diseases that are transmitted from plant to plant via insects. So then there's a you know, triatrophic area where you have the plant, you have the disease, and you have the insect, and they all work together uh, so that the, vi the virus can survive in the gut or the stylus of the insect, the aphid, for example, so that the aphid can feed on one plant, pick up a virus. The virus has evolved to be able to survive one way or another in the insect long enough so that when the insect feeds, feeds on another plant, the virus is, and disease is transmitted to the other plant. So my area is really the weed science. There are others that are specialized in the diseases or the insects. Uh, and then we have crossover, people that look at the, how the insects is involved in transferring the disease from plant to plant. So it's all biology-based. We call that uh, uh, biology with a purpose because really what we do um, deals with real-world problems that we're trying to solve. So is this more of a pure science building where you're just finding out more about things or do you do a single question that you want answered and you research that or is it a little bit of both? So uh, that's a good question. Uh, you know, uh, our aim is to do pure research to solve applied problems. So that in the end, there's always something that's deliverable. In the end, we hope to have something that's deliverable that can have an impact on agriculture, on crop production, on disease management. But the way we achieve these applied solutions is by using very rigorous, scientifically-based methods. Wonderful. Well, we should take us on a tour. I'd love to see the place. Okay. So that's the main hall, and I'm just going to show you a couple of labs. The one uh, that we'll do first is the one that I'm uh, responsible for. And something that we do in the weed science group is we don't claim ownership in the sense that this is not the Dion's lab and this is not the uh, uh, Nissen's lab. Uh, this will be the uh, physiology lab, or the biochemical lab, and then this one will be the physiology lab. And our students can move around freely between all the labs to use all the equipment. And then the molecular lab, which will be in the plant science building. So I apologize, this room is kind of loud because we have all kinds of compressors and uh, equipments. Uh, and so in here, we do a lot of uh, our plant extractions or plant uh, uh, processing. And then we have equipment where we can uh, uh, analyze metabolites in plants. So the two main equipment for that will be this one, which is a GCMS, it's a gas chromatograph with mass spectrometry. And it's, you know, it's a big name because in science we like to use big names, but basically it's a machine that can separate compounds and then we can quantify the compounds of interest in plants. And these will be more compounds that can volatilize, whereas this machine in the back is an LCMS, and so it's a very similar concept, but instead of gas chromatography, it's liquid chromatography. So we separate compounds based on liquids versus gas. And so these will be more water soluble molecules. Uh, and it's a pretty expensive piece of machine, but it's, uh, it's a really wonderful that it, uh, when in the past we would inject a sample on a, in, out of an extract from the plant with a, what's called a UV detector, looking at anything that absorbs UV, there will be thousands of compounds coming out. With this machine, we can hone in to only the compounds we're interested in, so that we'll get one peak rather than the thousands of peaks. It makes the analysis a lot simpler. That's, that's something that's a really, it's a really um, 
I don't know if it's unspoken or not, but people say, oh, college tuition is so expensive, or why did they name another building after that other guy that just gave tons of money? You have a piece of equipment like this, and I, am I allowed to find out what one of these oh, yes. right so you bought it? I bought it used for $300,000. <laughs> yes. Wow. So I'm actually still paying for it. Uh, I have, wow. The CSU has a loan uh, system where the CSU paid for it, and then every, uh, every twice a year I make a payment. So, and I have two more payments, and they'll be paid for. But I, I mean, that's just that's one piece of equipment in one of your yeah. labs. You can see why this, you know, it's a it's a huge thing for students to be able to say, oh, I got to work with that thing because it told me all the rest of these other yeah. things. And and yet, if this is antiquated, ten ten years from now, with knowing technology, it might be a year from yeah. now. That's a, a huge expense. It is expensive that, that you have to do as, as a university to be taken seriously. Yeah. And constantly. And to be able to do the research. Yes. Uh, that's uh, yeah. really, we need that equipment. Yeah. So well, let's walk uh, to the next lab. So some of the things we do in this lab is uh, not only we look at metabolites, but we do a lot of biochemistry so we can extract enzyme from plants. And then we can measure the activity of these enzymes uh, and look at the effect of, you know, in our particular case, how herbicides maybe inhibit these enzymes. So uh, yeah, this lab, this one, right? so this lab, we actually, uh, you cannot come in because it's our radioactivity lab. So we use uh, radio labeled uh, uh, molecules to be able to track movement of molecules in plant. So you have to have a special permission to en enter this lab. Uh, and uh, uh, so there's all kinds of other equipment, not only to handle the radioactivity, but to measure and quantify the radioactivity in different ways. Yeah, old school beakers in here. Oh, yeah, like yes. It's a, it's, sure, yeah, you, you can shoot in, inside, absolutely. That's called a, a wet lab, which is, we use, you know, uh, a lot of uh, uh, water and buffers and plants. So in, I don't know if you can zoom in, but right now we're doing some experiments in the hood where we're using aquatic plants, and the hood will be way in the back over there. So uh, this particular project, I believe they're looking at uh, an aquatic herbicide and they use a, a, a radioactive version of that herbicide so they can look at how quickly it moves into the aquatic weed and what's happening to the herbicide once it's in the, in the weed. So the radioactivity portion, again, forgive my lack of knowledge in this field, but the radioactivity portion is just to speed up the reactions or it is literally to say, hey, with radio radioactivity, what are the reactions of plants around it? Yes, yeah, so the reason why we use radioactivity is because nothing else in the plant is radioactive, right? So if we put a herbicide, you don't make a single peak, it's a single molecule. And so then we put that in, in, and the plant is exposed to it. When we expose, when we extract the plant, if we run in on a machine to separate and we get two peaks, then we know nothing else was radioactive. So that peak that's radioactive that was not there before, the plant used what was radioactive and made it in something else. Ah. That's called metabolism. So we can tell that the plant used the herbicide and metabolized it into something else. And instead of looking at, as, as I was saying with the other machine, where we have potentially thousands of compounds to look at, here, using radioactivity, we ignore everything else. We only look at what's happening to the radioactive molecule. Now, that seems to me to be one of those watershed moments in science and history. It, for, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's like, a, it's, like, it's like the battery. We have battery technology based on one particular way of storing mm -hmm. energy. When we had this moment in science where we realized that radioactivity could tell us something, was that that moment where you started having much of your scientific research involving radioactivity at that point, or is it not as big a deal as it sounds? Well, like? it's no longer a big deal uh, because, of course, we're talking about Marie Curie and a long time ago, right, when all this was being worked out. So while we use this technology to this day because it's so practical and very quantitative, uh, this same technology is used in medicine for uh, radio uh, analysis where they, they can, um, uh, some of the method where people look at uh, different metabolic pathways in humans, they use low doses of radioactive molecules with the, or, that they can track. And those, um, the one we use in plant is a C14, has a very long half-life. And the one that I use in human with the special machines, they have very short half-life, so they are much safer for humans. But the use of radio-labeled chemistry, uh, you know, is pretty old, but it's used to this day because it's so effective and so quantitative. It's probably not an inexpensive thing to get a hold of at, from a college level either. Yes, that's correct. <laughs>
All right, so then, the, as I mentioned, the thing I like about this building is not only we have our offices, we have our lab, but we have a greenhouse. So you you also a have a sense of humor here, because uh, I'm, I'm looking at this sign that says, I'm sorry, Dave, I'm afraid I can't do that, yeah. on, the, on your on your uh, your panel here with that's all, those all the at coming. at stuff and we are not allowed to open this door <laughs> that's for people that know what they're doing right i've seen one or two comics up and i think you guys obviously have a sense of humor here in this building very nice so let's go in here maybe let's um there's a lot walkway this way so let's go this way so there are many greenhouses uh, at csu but this one actually is uh, dedicated to uh, the weed science group. So we manage and we pay for all the maintenance and everything that happens in here. So actually these, uh, these uh, trays are uh, some demonstrations that uh, we use for our students in the weed science course that we teach. So they were sprayed with different herbicides and you can tell some herbicides will kill broad leaves but not grasses, right? And it looks like there's different types of soil here, yeah, too. Yeah, different is that types right? of soil. So they were looking at that. Uh, and so then uh, we use this greenhouse a lot for our work with uh, our herbicides, for example. Because yeah. then the other, the other greenhouses around us, it will be more restricted to use herbicides so that uh, we don't want to have, let's say there was a herbicide that's volatile. If we spray that, it could affect the growth of plants in another bench. We don't want that to happen in the rest of the university greenhouse. Now, are most of your studies going to be done on the weeds themselves? Like, for instance, for you, would you do studies on the weed and then apply them to the other plants? Or would you say, no, we're just going to study the plants in general? Do you know, because I'm seeing mostly, uh, you know, the, here's beans. Yeah, beans and, and corn. corn. So the, these will be, this is, like I said, this is just a demonstration for our students. But if you turn around, then we, this would be a weed right here. Um, uh, so we typically work with the weeds themselves. Now you say uh, weed, is that our, I want to say Russian thistle, is that tumbleweed? <laughs> tumbleweed, no? yeah. So, so, we, uh, so we, whatever weed uh, is causing a problem to the farmer, these will be the weeds that we'll work with specifically. Now sometimes we'll go to model systems, like plants that are not weeds, to uh, maybe test specific hypotheses, but in the end, we want to understand what's happening to the weed itself. Now, of course, we work with wheat as well, because wheat is a major crop in Colorado. So we have uh, uh, some experiments on wheat. So that, that sometimes the conversation gets pretty tricky, because weed and wheat sound very similar, but of course, they are quite different. Um, so uh, we use whatever plant is most appropriate for the experiments we want to do. Got to pay for those big machines, don't yes, you? Yes, yes. OK, so maybe we can step back out. So, so one thing I did want to ask, if it's not confidential again, just in that, just in that room alone, the expense of all of those pieces of equipment, I mean, that's got to be absolutely phenomenal. And again, with technology moving at the rate that it's moving, they become obsolete so quickly. So how does a university constantly upgrade and put, put money off of capital expenditures when, when what you're doing now is so important and yet it's obsolete mm. in 15 minutes? So uh, that's always you know, a struggle just because, as I mentioned earlier, our goal is to uh, you know, do research to uh, answer very applied questions but use you know, basic science to be, uh, use the most advanced methodology to achieve um, the, the results that we're looking for. So uh, that's expensive. And so one way that we are doing this is we write grants. You know, see the whole process of being a professor is to getting money to be able to do the research. And the money pays for the student's salary or stipends. Uh, we'll pay for the student's tuition. You know, we pay our student's tuition for the graduate students I'm talking about and then have money to buy equipment. Now the university also has programs, sometimes they have matching funds. If you have enough fund, they, they would match to buy something that's more expensive. Or sometimes several professors come together to pull money to buy one piece of equipment that will be shared among other people. And then the university has several uh, what we call core facilities where they made major investments so that there are some exp machines that are even more expensive than what I have. Uh, that are then available 
uh, and maintained by the university. Uh, and then if I want to do an analysis, then I'll pay the university for just an analysis. So let's say the piece of equipment is a million dollar. Uh, I couldn't afford that, but it's there on campus. But then I can do my experiment, extract what I want to extract, and ask them, okay, can you run that for me? And they'll charge me you know, $70 per sample for, you know, as a way for them to pay back the instrument. So there's many ways to have access to this top technology. Um, and sometimes it's within our own lab. Sometimes we go to core facilities to, to achieve that.